screen that is a toolbar, you'll see one that says CC and you can disable that. Thirdly, some people didn't realize it, but you can actually move the gallery around the screen so that you're able to see the PowerPoint slides a little better. By clicking on the pictures of the people, you can move them to the top or to the left side. We would like to ask that you put your questions in the chat box and those questions will be answered at the conclusion of the session. At that time, if you don't know how to do that, you're welcome just to raise your hand and we will get to you at that point. We would remind you that we are videotaping today's session. When the session is concluded, we will email you a copy of that link with a short survey to get your feedback on today's presentation. Thank you, Target, next slide. We would like to begin by introducing our panel of presenters. I'm Colleen Zawatsky. I'm the president of the Tully Lake Property Owners Association and also a member of the executive board of CAFOCLA. Uh, following the introductions will be Joe Heath. Joe Heath has been the general counsel to the Onondaga Nation and a longtime friend of theirs for more than 40 years. He's going to be talking about Onondaga land. Following Joe will be Jay Curry. Jay is the town of Preble historian. He's going to be talking about the early colonial settlers. After Jay will be Margie Grillo. Marge is a longtime resident of Song Lake, uh, more than 45 years. She is the co-president of the Song Lake Property Owners Association and a member of CAFOCLA. She's going to be talking about the early camp days and the association days. Following Marge will be Tarki. Tarki is the treasurer and secretary of Song Lake Property Owners Association. She is also the president of CAFOCLA and the president of NYSFOLA, the New York State Federation of Lake Associations. Tarki will be talking about the fauna, the flora, and the lake ecology of Song Lake. When Tarki has concluded, Gloria Wright, who is the other co-president of the Song Lake Property Owners Association, she will be facilitating today's questions and answers. Next slide. Um, I would like to begin by just giving you a little bit of the geology and the, um, the placement of our kettle lakes in our watershed systems. The Kettle Lakes were formed about 10,000 years ago, as many of you know, when the last glacial retreat left this part of the Northeast, leaving behind those massive, huge depressions, which filled with massive blocks of ice. Those kettles became our pristine Kettle Lakes. These were formed about the same time as the Finger Lakes. If you look at the left side of the slide, you will see a picture of the actual Chesapeake Bay watershed. And it's kind of like nesting dolls, watersheds within watersheds. And we are actually the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So if you left our Kettle Lakes and went through the Teofneoga River and down through the Susquehanna, you would eventually end in the Chesapeake Bay. The right slide shows where we are in relation to the upper Teofneoga River Basin, and you'll see those small kettle lakes in the upper northwest. Next slide. In 2009, we became a nonprofit 501c3. Our four kettle lakes gathered together to form a collaborative effort that would provide education and outreach, mutual support, and shared opportunities for problem solving for some of the issues that we all share. If you look at the right side, you'll notice some of those have been talked about in previous sessions. We know that glo global warming and climate change is causing our warmer waters, leading to overabundant growth of um, aquatic invasive species, harmful algal blooms, and often coupled with those massive storm runoffs. We know that we are trying to mitigate those efforts now as a collaboration. We try to diminish overdevelopment, and we also want to remove un undesirable infrastructure. Um, I would like to introduce Joe Heath. He's going to talk about the Onondaga land. Thank you, Colleen. 
and uh, thank all of you who are joining us this evening. Uh, my job is to remind us that Song Lake and all of the Kettle Lakes are part of the original Onondaga Nation territory. Um, they enjoyed the use of about two and a half million acres. We'll see a map of that in a minute. Um, right down through the center of central New York. We are essentially in the middle, both east and west and north and south. And I always start my environmental talks with this slide that reminds us that we have, uh, we have to think back because uh, particularly in our work around Onondaga Lake, but also all of the lakes, we're often told, uh, well, forget the fact that the lake used to be really clean and you sort of have to accept it in the damaged condition that you now find it. So um, we always try to think back to what the water was before the Europeans got here, after thousands of years of Onondaga use and stewardship. Waters were pristine. The fish were so abundant that when settlers came up from Pennsylvania, they raved about it in their writing. A third of the Onondaga diet was fish. And so they also had used the Teofnioga River extensively for um, <clears throat> trade down to the Chesapeake. In fact, we hear, uh, we read about Haudenosaunee and Onondaga traders meeting the English at Jamestown in the early 1600s. Next slide, please. This is a painting by Eli Thomas, an, uh, an Onondaga citizen, a member of the Wolf Clan, and it's about the Kettle Lakes. And he reminds us that these lakes are sacred to the Haudenosaunee and the Onondaga because about a thousand years ago when the Peacemaker and Hiawintha were forming the Confederacy, bringing together the then five nations, they took a year off from that work. They had a hard time with a couple of people at Onondaga and Hiawintha lost four daughters. And so they took a break. They came down here for a year on one of these lakes. And out of that came the cultural practices of condolence, how to overcome grieving after a death, and the use of wampum to record events, which we all know now is how the Haudenosaunee recorded their treaties and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Those wampum were probably made from the pearly mussels that were in our, our lakes. And Eli reminds us that Tully was the first place for forgiveness and wampum, condolence and wampum. We are earth and sky, everything is related and connected. Nothing stands alone. And if we would remember that cultural link to our lakes, to the Onondagas, the lakes are living relatives. If we treated them like that, they would probably be in better shape. Next slide, please. This is a map that the New York State Museum made at the, around the turn of the last century. This, I think it's 1904, but it depicts 1600, which is just before the French began to come down into New York from their colonial base up in Montreal. And it shows you the Onondaga territory in the center. And you can see that they enjoyed uh, tremendous water resources, uh, the eastern end of Lake Ontario, uh, and uh, so this is where things were in 1600s. In the next hundred years, the Haudenosaunee tended to consolidate their strength, to bring in neighboring nations, but that's the way it was just before the Europeans began to come into the territory. And we have one more slide, I believe. Next slide, please. This map particularly depicts, easy for me to say, the way things were in 1776, right at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. And it shows you that we are in the country of the Six Nations. And you can see the, uh, the North-South trade group. And there's even a hill here that's marked in an Onondaga word next to these lakes, right in the middle. If you look right underneath the word of, you'll see that the big hill, which we think is Song Mountain, had a name even 
before the Europeans were living here. And one of the things that I hope this slide shows us is that at the beginning of the Revolutionary War, there were no settlements, no towns, maybe a fort up in Oswego, but it was still the country of the Six Nations. And that brings us up to the next speaker, who is Jay Curry. He's the town of Preble historian, and I appreciate your listening. And remember, these lakes were clean, filled with fish. This is Onondaga territory. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jay Curry. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, yeah. I'm Jay. Hi, I'm Jay Curry. Thank you, Joe. Um, it's an honor to be here today. I'll be briefly talking about the mili military tracks of Central New York and what we know as Song Mountain or Song Lake today. In 1790, the U.S. government created the military tracks of Central New York to compensate the New York soldiers after their particip participation in the Revolutionary War. Central New York was divided into 28 different townships, each comprising of 100 lots with 600 acres. The state of New York established the tracks as bounty land for the Revolutionary War veterans to draw from. Soldiers were awarded between 600 and 3,000 acres, depending on their rank. According to the Onondaga Nation, between 1788 and 1822, the nation lost 95% of its land. Preble was one of the original towns settled when Cortland County was organized in 1808. The next screen, please. Uh, Preble's natural resources are farmland, forest, the Tyacknoga River, and several small lakes. What we know as Song Lake today was also known as Van Heusen Lake, named in 1791, Preble Lake, named in 1874, and Song Lake, named in 1905. In 1790, Samuel Dean owned 600 acres of land on Lot 67, north of Song Lake. The town covers 27 square miles, or 5.5% of the county. Agric agricultural use is 58%, and state and county-owned forest parks and wetlands occupy 13%. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Margie Grillo. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll pick up with some more recent history, uh, bringing us up to the present time. Um, we have an island in the middle of our lake that belongs to the Girl Scouts. In 1908, David Van Hoosen had a large two-story home on the island, which is pictured here the, on the right. Um, he used to ferry people to the island to attend his parties. At some point, the house burned down and wasn't rebuilt. Only the foundation remains today. The Girl Scouts have camped out on the island, uh, but not in recent years. Camp Hoover takes up most of the east side of Song Lake and occupies 90 total acres. It's now being called the Hoover Adventure Camp. We have often wondered how our lake got its name. There is a story that's been told that Mr. Van Hoosen's son used to frequent the local bars, and as he walked home, he would be singing loudly along the way. People started calling it Song Lake. Whether this is true or not, we aren't sure, but we love the name of our lake regardless. Next slide, please. This shows the streetcar. Uh, Ken Collier narrative describes his father building one of the first camps in 1930. That would take the street, they would take the streetcar to Preble and walk to the south shore of Song Lake. That is about 2.8 miles, I looked it up, and uh, from Preble Center to Song Lake and walking would take about 48 minutes, give or take, I'm sure. Um, and there's still um, long history with the Collier family on Song Lake. Um, there's an area of the lake that's called Collier's Point. And um, Ken's, let's see, it would be his granddaughter still is living there now. Next slide, please. So this is a photo that shows both Ken Collier, second from right, and his father Clarence, far right, who were mentioned in the previous slide. It's kind of a nice old picture. It's probably about 1930s because he, there isn't a 
built a camp, it's a tent, so maybe they were camping in where they have a camp, their camp is, is now. We're not sure about that for sure, what the, where the picture is taken. Next slide, please. This is Elaine Amadon describes going swimming in 1920 at the south end of Song Lake and enjoying the white calcium sand beach. We live at the north end of the lake and RD called our property the swimming hole track. We also had a sandy shoreline. Mrs. Hollenbeck, who owned a lot of property around the lake, used to charge people to park there and swim. And I swam there myself as a teen and it was great swimming. Next slide, please. The Song Lake Property Owners Association was incorporated in July of 1956. One of the founding members was Don Collier, again, the Collier name, a son of Kenneth, who provided the narrative on an earlier slide. We used to have a very active social component to the association, and especially in the 70s and 80s. We hosted a large summer clam bake, which was attended by people beyond our own uh, association, and a March dinner dance. The 4th of July boat parade was, and sailboat race were big events. In later years, we have held canoe and kayak races as well. We have still have a boat parade, although not as many participate. And if you notice on one of the slides, you can see some of the activities taking place, probably one of our uh, meeting, picnic and association meetings. And it looks like, is that maybe Tom Hughes in the, on the lake giving a ice fishing clinic? Um, possibly. Um, the annual meeting and picnic in August is well attended and over the years it has been held under our tents in homes at the Girl Scout camp and most recently on Zoom. Next slide, please. This shows our watershed hydrogeologically. On the left is the uh, surface watershed boundary. It's outlined in green. The ground water sh watershed is much larger, larger and both impact our lake and the other Kettle Lakes. The second picture shows Song Lake is a very shallow lake with the deepest point being 30 feet. And that's just south of the island. And it's marked with a buoy, which we use that spot for our sea slap testing. You can see the shallow shoreline and the no lake zone, uh, which leaves just the dark blue areas for safe motor Boating. There is also a sunken island in the north areas of the lake, which is marked with three buoys to keep boats away. By the end of the summer, as the water goes down, that area is exposed almost every year, and people sometimes picnic out there on Labor Day. So it's a fun thing to see with chairs sitting out. Looks like they're in the middle of the lake. Next slide, please. This uh, shows our watershed statistically. On the left, it says we have a 788 acre watershed. We have a 105 acre lake. So that's an eight to one watershed to lake ratio. When you combine the forest, shrub, scrub, and wetland areas, we have 75% of natural protection of the lake. We need to be constantly vigilant, however, in protecting our wetlands from the pressure of development. And that's all my slides. The next presenter is Karchi Heath. There we go. Thanks, Margie. Um, so uh, we have titled this presentation, Song Lake, A Beautiful Place to Live. So I wanna share some photographs that um, I and others have taken over the years of some of the flora and fauna. Mm -hmm. This is our riparian area right in front of our house. And you can see that it's uh, clustered with beautiful uh, red lobelia or cardinal flowers. We also have milkweed, both common and swamp milkweed. And the monarchs do come in um, and so do um, the hummingbirds. So that's nice to see. This is a blue flag iris, it's native. Um, uh, this is, um, we have tr uh, trilliums that are just about to come up and jack in the pulpits and other spring beauties that are ready to emerge. We also have magnificent trees and trees are really so critical to the protection of our watersheds. We have red oaks, a variety of maples, uh, cottonwood, hemlock, 
and many others. So the water uptake of these trees is of course species dependent. It also depends on the size of the trees, the girth, the season. There are a lot of things that make a difference. However, looking up uh, some of the averages for the summer season, a mature maple can average 70 gallons a day of uptake, mature oaks 80, and mature cottonwoods and hemlocks 50 to 200 gallons. Now, it's hard to imagine that, but when I look it out, out here at our huge cottonwood, somehow it does make sense. Um, they are magnificent trees and they're very important, not only for the beauty of the lake, but for the health of the lake. So this is a montage of different birds that some of them come through migratory birds like the loons and the grebes and others stay year round. Um, we do have raptors. So I'm gonna point out too, this is a Merlin that came by and uh, stood on the deck one day. This is uh, an eagle that comes over very frequently. This eagle um, is from a nest, a viable nest over on Tully Lake, but they like to come over here and eat our fish too. Um, we also have lovely blue herons and green herons. These are one of my favorites. You can see a spiky little feathers up there when he gets upset. And um, osprey and many songbirds that, that come through and some stay year round. And other critters. Some of us are easy to spot. Some of us spot us pretty easily too. Um, and uh, the snapping turtle, this was actually taken by Joe. This large snapping turtle was either on her way to or from scratching uh, an area along the side of the road for eggs. We have a little snake down here. This I wanna point out, this is actually a crayfish from Song Lake. This picture was taken by Michelle Herman, who was an ESF student uh, or was a student at the time doing work on our lake. Um, not sure about why it's so colorful. Maybe it was a breeding season and male, but um, it's a Song Lake crayfish. This little uh, freshwater jellyfish, I didn't even know existed. Kim, uh, Professor Kim Schultz was uh, diving uh, doing a project here once and she came back and said, there's just these freshwater jellyfish all over. Um, eventually one of our uh, SUNY Oneonta students brought this in and it's about the size of the end of your finger. It's very small and they're not native. They probably came in around the 1800s but they don't seem to be doing any harm to the lake. They seem to have naturalized. And we have fish. This inventory was taken again by Strader Caves who did our watershed management plan. Um, it's very similar to the inventories that were taken back in the 1900s. Walleye were once stocked. That is Don Collier, <laughs> that same Collier family. And he caught that walleye. Um, a little bit later in his life than the picture we saw previously. But children fish, we have um, a lot of different folks that are angling out there on a regular basis. So some of the um, fish that we have that are native are bluegill, chain pickerel, black crappie, bullhead, and what are some people consider wool class largemouth bass. And this fish well, that gentleman is actually kissing a fish. Um, he is also an ESF student. That's a chub sucker. And the reason he was so excited about finding this fish was initially we thought it might have been a lake chub sucker. So the ESF uh, got some, we got some grant money and they did a DNA test on a couple of the fish that they caught. And it was inconclusive. So it's probably a hybrid between a creek chub sucker and a lake chub sucker but we do still love our chub suckers. So in order to keep our fisheries healthy, we need to have a healthy lake ecology. And that's uh, what we're looking at here. This is a, a very simplistic view of what the aquatic food chain is. Um, this comes from Diet for a Small Lake. And I really recommend this book. It's a tremendous resource. And you can just you can look up just about anything in there and get a decent answer about lake ecology um, and other issues around around um, uh, association and so forth. 
So it starts with the sunlight coming in and providing that energy that's needed for those uh, autotrophic um, primary food sources like the phytoplankton here that can make their own food through uh, uh, photosynthesis. And they provide the food for the zooplankton and they provide the zooplankton provides the food for the little fry, which goes to the big fish, which comes up to the top of the food chain. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than that simple little uh, cycle. So below our, oops, below us, below the surface of the water, there's a lot of activity. It's complex and it's fast and it's busy. <clears throat> so these pictures were taken, not the top two, but these bottom four were taken with a microscope. And thanks to the EPA program, Cyanoscope Monitoring Collaborative, um, they sent me a little eyepiece camera so I can put that in there and take pictures uh, uh, through the microscope. So we have a diatom, we have paramecium here. Uh, this is just, can't get that. Filamentous algae. And this is uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, we do have and have had harmful algal blooms in our lake over time. And this is just one picture of uh, Dolichus firmum, formerly known as anabina, and then a microcystis in the corner. <clears throat> Let's see. These two um, plants come right from Song Lake. This is actually a native milfoil. It's not the Eurasian milfoil that is seen um, along other lakes um, or even the variable leaf that's seen uh, in, like in lakes like Tully, uh, not Tully, Little York, I apologize. Um, but it is a nuisance, even if it's native and it, it looks okay here, but boy, by the end of the season, it looks pretty ratty. <laughs> the, uh, the other plant that I chose to show here is a native cress, uh, Neobachia aquatica. It is classified as a rare plant in New York State. You know, and I come to like some of the plants that we have in our lake. Um, I know we call them weeds, but there's a whitewater marigold that I think is really lovely and lovelier than this. So every year it's something. And we do have a nutrient rich lake. And so these are pictures of some of the blooms that we've had on Song Lake. Um, and smack in the middle is a zebra mussel. Zebra mussels were first found on Song Lake, again, with the, the, the uh, ESF students and uh, Professor Kim Schultz. We were doing a rake toss, and there they were on the plants. So that was in 2017 that we first not noticed them. The, um, One of the ways that we, besides working with universities, one of the ways that we help make sense of what's going on here is by participating in CSLAP, the Citizen Statewide Lake Assessment Program. And this program is provided to us through the New York State DEC and the New York State Federation of Lake Associations. It was started in 1985 and um, Right now, we actually have trained participants in the numbers of 400 across the state. We have about 160 lakes that participate in the program. And um, over the years, over 270 lakes have participated. So we are trained. The teams are, uh, this is actually a training session over at Little York Lake a few years back. Um, our testers on Song Lake consist of Carl and Margie Grillo. Gloria Wright, Terry and Donna Evans Orr, Tom Abrams, and myself. Others also help us around the lake. Sometimes we need some assistance with boats and so forth. It's really kind of a fun thing to do on a Saturday morning. Um, and we get to know each other and we get to know the lake. I want to also mention Tony George, although he does not uh, test with us any longer. He was at the core of this when we started and there were days there were testing times when it was just Tony and Carl out there doing the testing. So thank you, Tony, for all that work early on. We sample eight times a season every two weeks, the beginning of June. And our samples are tested at um, Upstate Freshwater Institute, their lab. 
they do the uh, chemical analysis. You've got uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, chlorophyll A, conductivity, um, pH, chlorides, and, and halves. I'm gonna focus on these two. These are two parameters we do right off on the boat, uh, temperature and clarity. And then we do other observations through our testing. This is a camera and it's a, a little device that it closes. So you get it right to the level in the water that you want it and it closes so it grabs the sample right at that uh, particular spot. And we test, we grab samples at a meter and a half down from the top and then we find the bottom and we go a meter and a half up from the bottom to grab samples. This is a sucky disc over to the left and that's Carl again, dropping a sucky disc down for a reading. And it, it's not really high tech. You just put it down until it disappears and, <laughs> and then you get that reading of the depth and um, do it again as it comes back up. And all of our CSLAP data is available if you go to either the DEC website, CSLAP, or NISVOLA. So I wanna talk a little bit about the impact of zebra mussels um, and what we've seen through our um, observations. Excuse me. So zebra mussels, they produce at a staggering rate. Each female zebra mussel can lay as many as a million eggs each summer. The young or the villagers travel then in the water currents and they develop what is called a foot. It's an appendage that then latches onto any hard surface. So rocks, um, which abound in our lake. Uh, it's, a, it's a cobbly bottom in some areas as well as um, any docks and uh, cement. And they're, you try to pull them off and, and they're just like rubber bands. And they're really, really difficult to um, pull off of any surface they've attached to. There are multiple impacts from this invasive species. Um, we're gonna talk about water clarity right here because they eat the tiny algae and plankton that we talked about earlier. That does make the water clearer, but the water clarity also allows more sunlight to enter the lake, creating opportunities for aquatic plants to grow that didn't have that opportunity previously. On Song Lake, we see an increase in water clarity from a previous average, and we're talking long-term data, a previous average of about two to three meters down. We now have some secchi disc readings that go as far as eight meters down. That is significant considering that at the deepest part of our lake, 30 feet, um, that's nine meters. So we're almost hitting the bottom. One zebra mussel can filter about a quart or a liter of water per day and the large colonies filter vast amounts of water. This also removes an important food source from the lake. Unfortunately, they don't eat cyanobacteria. I'm not sure if, uh, if, if I say they spit it out, I'm not sure that's accurate, but they don't eat it. They, they just get rid of it. Um, and in fact, lakes that have <clears throat> zebra mussels tend to have an increase in harmful algal blooms. So the beauty of CSLAP is that we have this great database and we can look and see the difference between the surface water temperature and the bottom water temperature and how it's changed over time. And I'm gonna show you some graphs, so just bear with me on this a minute. Um, we have over the years had a really nice separation between the um, surface water temperatures and the lower uh, temperatures, usually mixing in September. But with this clarity of the water combined with an increase um, through global warming of our, of our uh, temperatures, uh, we have optimal conditions for plant growth throughout the lake. And that is what we're seeing. Okay, I'll bore you with the slides. I'll do this really quickly. Um, but it is cool. We, we have this data set. This is the surface water temperature. This, has, this is pretty consistent for years and years and years, where we have a nice separation between the um, epilimnium and the hypolimnium. Then after the introduction of the zebra mussels, it changed dramatically. Um, we even wondered if our thermometers were off 
because it was so troubling. But you can see that um, right here, this would be July, the two temperatures become the same, the surface and the lower. It was not quite so dramatic uh, last year. And so we're looking to see if this is just like a one-time event or if um, we are really actually seeing a, a decline in our uh, uh, thermocline. So there are some things we can control and some things we cannot. Unfortunately, the heat factor is not something that we can control. But we can mitigate it a bit by shading our shorelines. I'll go back to trees one more time. They're so important for our watersheds. They provide um, not only shade, but they really are the best stormwater protectors. We can't change the fact that we have zebra mussels. They're here. And as far as I know, um, and talk to many people about this, there, there really isn't anything to do except coexist. <laughs> and so, but they may vary in intensity from year to year. So we'll, again, see where it goes. What we wanna be sure we do is keep the zebra mussels in our lake and not transport them to other lakes. Um, and at the same time, we also want to minimize the intrusion of any other invasives into our lake by following uh, good protocols, good practices, cleaning, draining, and drying all of our equipment before coming into the lake. So our storms are increasing in intensity and that increases stormwater runoff. This uh, picture was created by um, a student, uh, let me get his name correctly, jo Josue Cruz. And he did this for our watershed implementation plan, which was created by Princeton Hydro and Syracuse University assisted along with our uh, soil and water district. So what the watershed implementation plan shows is what we can do to mitigate stormwater runoff in areas that need that more than others. Mike Hartshorn is on the call today. So thanks Mike. Mike was principal in, authorize, in authoring our watershed implementation plan. So landscaping this way can provide flood protection, protection of water quality by trapping sediments and pollutants, bank stabilization from stormwater and wave action, and that includes from storms or boats. It provides shade and wildlife habitat corridors. And of course, it's pretty, it provides aesthetics. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to replant some of the native species that have been um, taken out and replaced with non-natives. So this watershed implementation plan is available at our website. So we have vegetation and it's going to grow and we're, we have optimal uh, conditions for our vegetation to grow very well. This is difficult. It's not just Song Lake, but it really is across all of our lakes that we're seeing a lot of plants growth. Um, I, through NYSFOLA, I've been reading um, several newsletters from other uh, lake associations, and each of them highlights what they're doing about aquatic invasive species and mitigating plants that are growing uh, and proliferating. The name of that conference is coming up, by the way, at the end of uh, April is called Freshwater Ecosystems, Learning to Coexist, because that's what we really need to do. Shoreline removal is something that we've done and will continue to do on Song Lake. Uh, it is labor intensive, but it really remains one of the best ways to get the plants out of the lake so that we remove the phosphorus that co goes with the plants and it also prevents them from dying back, going into the lake again and receding as well. Most of our neighboring lakes have been using large aquatic weed harvesters. Tully um, has for many, many years, I know. Um, we are looking into that. We have done, we have contracted last year in the fall, but it's tough because, well, you get the contractor when the contractor has time, it is expensive, and it's a one-shot deal. The plants reemerge. Um, 
it's not perfect. So we also, uh, some of our residents use benthic mats and Little York Lake has had some success with small scale targeted herbicide applications. And we are talking with them about how that went on their presenting in fact next month. So there will give us another opportunity to just to have a, a greater discussion on that. So one more. We did have grass carp. Well, actually, we still do. There's probably about 40 or 50 left in there. But um, people ask, why don't we get carp? And um, we have requested a permit, but it has been denied. And the reason for the denial is that correlation between grass carp and the proliferation of harmful algal blooms has been demonstrated. And so they're not permitting carp in lakes that have had harmful algal blooms as Song Lake has had. If you look though, these were permitted. This, these are DEC permitted carp that were put into Song Lake. Let me see if I can go here. Um, from 1995 to 2005, whoop, there was a total of 2,504 carp in the lake. The other thing that has been learned over time is that these fish live much longer in our Northern lakes than was anticipated. So we just need to be vigilant about not sharing um, the wealth. We have to keep our invasive species where they are as, as much as we can. And that's the motto is clean, drain, dry. Just if you move a boat, if you move equipment, clean it, drain it, dry it. These are just some of the invasive species that are emerging in our, in our area. And if you go to the Finger Lakes prison site, they have a, a very good list. So, um, got folks to thank. I want to go back to the, the idea that Song Lake really is a beautiful lake to live. We have challenges like all lakes do, but it's gorgeous here. Um, and anyone, I think, who lives on a lake, no matter where it is, and no matter what the issues are, they love their lake. Um, and so that's how we feel. We're fortunate. So we also are fortunate because we've got these wonderful partners that work with us. Cortland County Soil and Water, the Conservation District has been very supportive in what we do. Uh, COFOCLA, which has sponsored this presentation, the New York State Federation of Lake Associations, SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and I have to say Professor Kim Schultz and her limnology practicum students have been just a treasure. I also want to point out Greg Boyer has also been a treasure. He was really instrumental in helping us in around 2008 or nine when we first had algal blooms and had no idea what they were. Um, so thank you, Greg. Also, um, Thuni Oniata, uh, our former student Strader Caves and his advisors were so helpful in putting together our watershed management plan. I want to make a special mention for uh, Upper Susquehanna Coalition. I just found out that they are the recipients of the New York State Environmental Excellence Award. And they, they're wonderful. They've helped us with shorescaping on Tully Lake. And we do a lot of uh, educational opportunities with them. So um, I think that's it. I, again, I mentioned my, uh, my cart charm before. Um, so what I'm going to do is turn it over to Gloria Wright and Colleen for your questions. Okay. Um, first question, are the grass carp still a little too abundant, overstocked as I think I may recall, or has their population come down some? Tarki, we touched on that a little bit, but what do you think? Still too abundant? Well, they're um, they're fat, they're old, and they don't eat as much. So I don't. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like me. <laughs> he said, "Sounds like me." <laughs> so if there's a fish person out here who, who can answer that question better. <laughs> Oh, that was a good answer. <laughs> they're, they're not having the impact that they that they were. It sounds. It seems like um, they may be aging out, and 
you know, you're looking to other means to control the vegetation. We, we estimate that there might be 40 or 50 out there. Strader, the, the grad yeah. student um, that I talked about, he put together this um, kind of a neat spreadsheet where he models um, the mortality rates, you know, against the stocking rates. And so I looked at that um, about a month ago and it, it, I think it came out to about 48 fish. So still out there. Still some, are there still some walleye? in the lake, some older fish swimming around? You know, I think the last walleye is the one that you saw with Don Collier, that Don Collier caught. Um, mm -hmm. You really haven't seen much. Um, and as you know, they need a cold water or yeah. more of a cold water habitat than we've got, I think. But you're welcome mm -hmm. to come and see if you can find any, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had no success in totally finding one yet, so I don't know that it was yeah, but I, I did catch them years ago in song when I first yeah. moved to the area, a few of them. So, yeah. Caught one once that the chance. first year we were here, too. Yeah. Okay. Has anyone come across rainbows? Rainbow trout coming into the lake? Gloria, do you, do you want to read that? Uh, well, I was going to go to the next, but we can skip down. No, go ahead. Has anyone come across the folklore about rainbows coming out of the lake? I remember someone mentioning this long ago. That was submitted by me. And I, I seem to recall something about an Indian maiden, princess, something, at losing a lover. Yeah, it's um, Rose, I think. Um, you know, I did, I did ask a couple of Onondagas about that um, and they kind of rolled their eyes and said it's a nice oh, story. Okay. They, didn't, they didn't think there was anything to it, but I, I'm going to keep asking. There might be something in there. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. Okay, do you find halves in all areas of Song Lake or are they specific to areas? Primarily the North End. Um, and just to add to that, they're usually localized. Um, they don't go across the whole lake as far as we have seen, but they're usually pretty localized. And yeah, the North End gets it. Gloria, um, Carl, Margie, us. <laughs> yeah. Although we had fewer last year than the year before, so maybe that's a step in the right direction. I think we've also seen, you know, streams, so you can almost see lines of green coming down the lake. So, yeah, you know, they don't just like blow up on our shoreline for any particular reason. They're coming from other places, but we mm -hmm. have the prevailing winds just, you know, send everything to us. And that contributes to the us having more. That's right, Margie. And they come and go. So someone could have one elsewhere, and but they wouldn't know unless they're out down on the shoreline and they're looking for them. I know. Is, is, um... I have a question, Tarky. Hi. Hey, um, hi. Um, as the as the lake water gets clearer, and the zebra mussels, you know, have an impact on the clarity and the vegetation changes. I mean, what kind of species of fish, what impact is that going to have on a species of fish over the next, you know, maybe decade or two or three? I'm not sure if you can even look that far into the future. Like what species might do better or suffer in this, in that new environment? Well, I, I'm not a fish person, but you know, and if there is a first, I think Tom Hughes might have some help here, but I, I do know that we wouldn't be able to have cold water fish, you know, it would be too warm. Um, and I, I don't know about, yeah, that's about all I can say. Tom, where'd you go? Yeah, I'm here. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, looking at the species list and the fish that are already in the lake, you know, they're they're mostly warm water, cool water fish. Um, there's a couple that I'm not super familiar with. Uh, I, I wouldn't expect to see um, dramatic changes in the fish that are in there now. You know, Jane Pickerel 
um, crappies, sunfish, perch. There may be some change a bit in population based on their the vegetation as it fluctuates with the water clarity, clarity levels, in, in my opinion. So you may see the ups and downs based on where juveniles might have areas to hide or you know, preferred vegetation for certain spawning uh, in, among the species. But the couple species I'm not familiar with, like the chub sucker, whether it's a hybrid or not, if that's gonna be vulnerable to warmer waters. Um, if it had been supporting minimally, you know, uh, in the past, you know, trout, whether they're coming in and out from another area, um, yeah, those probably wouldn't persist moving forward. Just one last comment too, interestingly, and there's probably other people on the call that, that can, you know, testify to this. You know, when, it, when, when zebra mussels first came into our water bodies, the predictions were often they're out of places. So um, things are still out there doing their thing, but you never know. Yeah, I've heard that too, Tom, that it's, that's why I said it's variable. You know, we don't know, it could be on and off years and yeah. Some, some years. Um, another question, are there any osprey nests on Song Lake? I am not aware of any. Is anybody? We've seen us for that totally big, haven't we? Yeah, but not nests. Oh, they gotta go somewhere. Yeah. I've seen them fly over, yeah. I've seen them fish, but I haven't seen any nests personally. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. So we've noticed that on Tully Lake. We've seen them fly over. We They must be nesting somewhere <laughs> in these kind of lakes. Um, I think that might have been the last question. Um, um, is there any others that anybody would like to raise their hand for before we close? Um, yeah. Go ahead, Jay. To the lady that was asking about the uh, Indian legend of uh, the Rainbow Maiden of Song Lake, that article was written in 1925, um, and I have that on my computer if she'd like to wow. send me an email. Sounds great. Maybe we can add that to the um, email that we'll follow up with. Just a little fun folklore. Okay. Any yeah. others before we close? Anybody else have something they'd like to ask or comment on? Um, on behalf of Kofokla, um, and I'm sure the Song Lake uh, representatives are grateful to have such a wonderful, wonderful turnout. We would like to invite you all to the final of our four Kettle Lake sharing sessions. It will take place on Tuesday, May 4th, and it will feature Little York Lake. And I think I saw Don on here, um, and we look forward to that. So uh, look forward to a mailer reminder for all of you. And uh, we thank you once again for your participation tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's great to see some of you. David, keep in touch, okay? <laughs> hey, everyone. Wonderful. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you all. Much. Thank you. Bye-bye.